The last one, and we'll come back maybe at the end, but I'm also going to put a photograph here of a, a dental um, sample that you and I have talked about at rather great length, at least between us, involving a, a test, and it is a test. It is not a cure for anything, but it is a test that many people may wish to um, uh, perform involving the use of, of red wine and or negotiably um, uh, peroxide. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more, but certainly the original foundation was discovered by uh, um, Dr. Scott, Gwen Scott, uh, using wine, red wine, a deep dark red wine alone. And we can consider that somewhat of a, a gift at this point, but the, again, it is not a cure. We'll talk about that more at the end on your side since you're the one that discovered that. Uh, I have a couple more points I'd like to make today. The second one has to do with a conference that has been recently held. Apparently this conference was titled the first Morgellons Annual Conference, if I have that right, uh, held fairly recently. The conference appears to have called together uh, serious researchers and to give, um, let's say, credibility to the, um, to the issue of this um, emerging and or now pervasive um, condition. And it may be just that. It may be a first professional organization and presentation of information at that level. That's fine. Uh, on the same token, however, I'd like to at least, let's say, make the audience aware that we might want to monitor how information regarding the subject is presented to the public, um, especially being alert for information that is inconsistent, which, that, um, which has been established by independent means. One comment in particular that came out of this conference that caught my attention was a, a coverage was covered by a CBS affiliate, affiliate. They went there on television there and covered this and um, said that they were the only television station to cover this event. They put a big headline on their television presentation that said, you know, this Morgellons condition, it may be that as many as 14,000 people across the world may have this condition and presented in somewhat of an astounding fashion. Unfortunately, the work that uh, Gwen and I have both worked on now uh, for really several years, but especially over the past several months with, uh, let's say, greater intensity, the unfortunate, unfortunate finding here is that the evidence and information indicates that we are speaking of something that is much of much broader distribution than you can imagine, that mentioning 14,000 people as containing certain uh, conditions is absolutely ludicrous from what I can see, and that the audience should seriously consider that the extent of what we are speaking of here may easily involve billions of people, and this is not an exaggeration. The majority of the population of the world may be under consideration here, and it is not fair in any way for any conference that is fairly considering the information to restrict this as some segregated group of unusual people that have something um, that we can push off for another two or years, two years as the CDC is trying to do. Third comment would be, well actually I've made this point um, strong enough already at this point, and that is the tie-in between what is being found biologically manifesting in the body and that of an environmental sample. I think I've made that point strong enough for today. The last comment would be that this information that has been presented publicly, open view under the, under the microscope with the best resources I have, has now been out there close to a year and a half. The first photographs of these unusual forms came out now close to a year and a half ago. To think that we're at the point that a year and a half later, with now rather intense work over the last several months, of presenting repeatable um, images that show uh, very unusual forms, which appear by all means to be pathogenic, and to not have those forms positively identified is absolutely atrocious. There is no excuse for this whatsoever, and it is one of my primary objectives at this point. We'll go further later on, but at this point there's absolutely no excuse for having these four specific forms. This is a minimum, four specific forms identified as to nature and function. And in fact, um, out of the conference that is going on, it's, it's, um, it's really not very sensible that, oh, we're now getting to the point where we can see some images on this. We've had some images now for at least a year and a half. So this is, this is my primary calling at this point. Get these things identified, and then we'll go further in terms of understanding what the effect is. And with that, oh, and the last thing was that there has been. There has been no suitable identification thus far. It's totally, totally void, basically, of of clarity 
um, and definition. And with that last comment, I'd like to pass things over to you, Gwen. I hope I didn't infringe on your time there too much, no, but we're no, going to no, do no, this no. again as, as much as we need to to get the information out. So I thank you very Take much. Take all the time you want, Thanks. my friend. Um, okay, I had some new developments using my own body laboratory, which is what I've been doing all along, and friends and family and whatever. Uh, but before I talk about that, I will say since our last discussion, I did have a gentleman who was involved in the design of some of this call me and when he when he was involved he said you know he felt he was doing something to help the soldiers in the field in this country they he was told that these things would be sprayed aerosol sprayed from planes on the enemy and they would save soldiers lives and then it occurred to him when he became aware and began to see uh, Clifford's work and other work that oops you know maybe that's not the case so now he's trying really hard to help out anybody that he can find that's trying to do the work and he explained something to me that I knew but I had kind of forgotten which is every organ in your body has a specific frequency and it it, it operates at that frequency and when you interrupt that frequency electromagnetically you can create all kinds of serious, even unto death, problems. He also talked about areas of the brain um, and mind control. And uh, as Orwellian as that may seem, apparently scientifically it's very real. And we know from Clifford's work uh, for years now, the electromagnetic properties of what's happening in our air supply as a result of the aerosol spraying and the manipulation of that. Beyond that, he talked about and confirmed to me the heavy metals, the barium, the titanium, um, the aluminum, uh, none of which, trust me, are good for the human, uh, the fibers. He felt that the fibers were metallic in nature. Uh, he talked about the biological. He said all of it has been altered. Uh, some of it, uh, and Clifford alluded to it earlier, can kind of escape your immune system, cloak itself in one form or another. Um, again, the electromagnetics, and also the lack of oxygen, the displacement of oxygen, and Clifford talked about that at the beginning of his work, that the more you displace or rid oxygen out of the air supply with particulates, it could be cornflakes, it doesn't matter, mortality rates go up concurrently and we are operating on a very low level of oxygen because of the displacement. So that alone doesn't, you know, forget all the components. That alone is very detrimental uh, to the human body. And as Clifford was talking about earlier, um, the red blood cell whose job it is to carry oxygen has been compromised. So we, it's actually pretty amazing that any of us are walking and talking. An article was brought to me, done by a research doctor in the 50s, talking about a condition called dysbiosis, which is uh, fungal overgrowth in the human body and what happens to the body, to the organs, to the person as, as that fungus, which is very aggressive, and in those days, probably just candida, uh, overtakes the human body and the resulting nanobacteria on and on and on that come out of that kind of circumstance which he blamed primarily on the use of antibiotics. I'm seeing, I believe, uh, something very similar to that where people literally fail because the fungus overtakes. I do have a friend who's a surgeon who told me they have opened people up now in operating rooms and closed them back up because their organs are so covered with this fungal matter they can't find the organs. So I feel assured that's at least a component with that in mind, folks, fungus does not do well if you don't feed it sugar. And I know that's hard news for a lot of people who love their sweets. But fungus cannot survive in a sugar-free environment, or at least average fungus, we don't know. But it would be something to consider to try to eliminate all sweets. If you can't do a little raw honey, that would be the best option. But sugar feeds this problem, so something to think about. And again, I am a naturopathic doctor, but most states do not license me. And that means I cannot diagnose, nor can I prescribe. 